So today we're going to be talking about customer development and discovery on the market. This isn't your, these are theories of markets. This is what we know as startup entrepreneurs works. And we're going to be talking pretty consistently about getting out of the building. My name is Susan Cornelius. I'm the principal of Accelerate to Solutions. And currently I'm the lead mentor for the Accelerator at UNM and for the, for the UNM University program. So we'll talk a little bit more about what I think I know how to do later, but right now let's talk about what we're doing here. So market fit and customer development have to do with getting out of the building. Um, I didn't come up with that phrase and make it real strong. That's Steve Blank from the Haas Business School at UC Berkeley. Most of what we think we're doing in the beginning when we get our great idea, in this case, maybe our great idea is a device that floats down the Rio Grande and determines water quality and communicates to an overhead drone which goes into a database and tells the Albuquerque Bernalillo County what the quality of water is in the Rio, which is being done right now. Um, we don't know what the business model is behind that when we first start out. We think we do, but generally they're hypotheses and that's okay. Many of you are scientists, many of you are business people and you wanna have a hypothesis about what your product is, what you think your market is, who's gonna use it, why is it unique? And what's the reason they're going to use it? You have to have those hypotheses. So if we approach this as scientific method, what is the problem I think I'm solving? What data do I have that proves that it and demonstrates that it's a problem? What are my hypotheses about what I can do to make a difference in the market? And how do I think I'm going to make money? What is the fit with market? And this is the market I think I can start out with to fund what I intend on doing in the future, making my product scalable. None of these things can be done without starting first with hypotheses. But as you know about hypotheses, they have to be demonstrated. And I don't care whether it's a retail uh, that, uh, uh, storefront that serves fancy desserts or it, it is a new device that is an eco-skeleton for robotics that's gonna help people who are paralyzed move. So let's just go on here and let's go on to the next slide. Um, the process of covered customer discovery is really about customer development. We like to say, all of us that are doing startups, I've been doing this for about 30 years, that from the moment you get the idea, you need to start talking to people. Now, who do we typically start? Our partner or our spouse or our professor or friends over a beer or family members. And they say, wow, Susan, that sounds like a great idea. You know, go forth, do it. Or Honey, do you really want to do it? You're not going to have any benefits and no vacation. What are you going to do for salary? They give us feedback and, and encourages us or discourages us. What we really need to be doing is talking to the market from the moment we get the idea, because we may be focused on a market that can't penetrate, an existing market that's too big. We have a tendency also to talk about new markets. We're going to talk a little bit about existing markets versus new markets and where should we look to penetrate with our idea and find out whether the customer likes it. So in customer discovery, we identify people we'd like to talk to. And this is a very interesting and sometimes scary process because sometimes we call up people who could be our competitors. And we say to them, I'm a student at the University of New Mexico, I'm in this program, or I live in Albuquerque and there's a real emphasis and push on startups. And I know that you have expertise in this and I wanna learn more from you about the market products, who uses them and why do people use them? Because believe it or not, we're not doing sales. And we're not talking in depth about our technology. This is not a sales call. And then at the end, we're asking them if we can remain in contact. You'd be surprised as to who says, says yes. So what we're doing is we're demonstrating who's the customer. We are looking to create future customers, so customer creation. And this is how we build the company. The company is not really built on the technology or the product. It is built on the existence of potential customers who see your product as meeting their needs. And that goes a little bit contrary to all the historical stories about market and um, Henry Ford and how he built this car and everybody. A um, little bit about my background, 30 years of experience in uh, validating companies and in, in, uh, technologies and helping them get started up. Um, for this last 30 years, I've been in the pre-A and A investment levels 
uh, working with uh, uh, VCs, venture capitalists as well. Um, I believe that as a mentor, I have to have an open giving philosophy and work and be very conscientious in helping my community um, launch companies because I know that's the future. I am from New Mexico, but I went to San Diego and that's where I cut my guns on doing this sort of thing. There are 6,500 small companies in San Diego, yet it is one of the wealthiest companies in the United States. There are only 65 companies there on the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, and those stock exchanges. Exactly what's going on there is that it's a company that has been built on the backs of small tech, small retail, all those kinds of things, small biotech especially. And some of those companies grew into huge companies. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So the focus of our presentation is talking to you about doing product and market interviews um, to answer the following questions. Will the customer buy, why? And, to dis and frankly, to discover what not to sell, offer, and ship. I frankly hear from people, I've been working on this product for 10 years, I've been working on this product for three years, and you know, I, I've sold some, and okay, so but what's the barrier? Why aren't more people buying what you're buying? And the answer typically is a building awareness and then finding out what they need. And most of the companies that I work with, probably 95% of them, uh, pivot their products. They, do, they start with one thing and they pivot that same pro product to do other things. Like let's say I am, I am building exercise suits uh, that help um, moisture be expressed off my body, okay? I'm, I'm doing doom. And um, I'm building one suit and it looks really military. And then I find out people want it in shades of Parisian pink, magenta, and bright iridescent green. I got a problem on my hands that if, and, and I may think to myself, that's pretty shallow. But if I start building them in those colors, will they wear them? Now, that's a silly example, but that is what happens. People pivot what they're doing, okay? Let's go, let's proceed. So I'm hoping at the end of this, you start creating a list of steps with due dates creating a list of people, companies, and competitors, ooh, that's interesting, and experts that you would like to research in depth and talk to. We're gonna talk about how you can talk to them. The number 100's up there because I, as a, 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 a person who has done investments, working with people who are doing investments, know that that's what they wanna hear. There really is some rules around this and it works. We want to see commitment. We want to see passion. And one of the things we're looking at is you, the founder of the company. Believe it or not, 95% of the decisions to invest are based on you. Do I think I can work with you? Are you coachable, meaning do you listen? And are you willing to pivot if the market tells you something different? And are you willing to take the bad news if the market says, we don't need another toothbrush? Okay, we want I want we want to he, we want you to set a date that if you're not set up on LinkedIn, um, because we need you to use LinkedIn to tell your story so people can find you when you don't have a website, or you can use Facebook Business. But most people, it's just a good idea to get up on link, LinkedIn, and also to have a large group of people you can go out to, um, because you're going to link with me, you're going to link with Matthew, you're going to link with other people um, to talk to the experts that are out there in the field. Create a rough draft of questions while we're talking that you might ask people and want to know the answers to and uh, create some hypotheses about what your market fit is. I like to give people the number three. Um, I get worried when somebody tells me everybody's going to use this and why, okay? Uh, for instance, let's say you have a yoga mat that's warm so you can do hot yoga like Jeff's working on. You may find that people who are working with seniors um, who for whom hot yoga would be good, um, want it to be, be able to be differently used. Maybe it needs to be used for chair yoga for, for seniors. How do I come up with a version that's going to be chair yoga? And is that a good market? And what are seniors spending on those kinds of things? And how many of them are doing chair yoga? And how, where is chair yoga being taught? Like in every senior center in Albuquerque. So these are the kinds of things we need to explore and find out about. And so we're going to create some hypotheses about market fit. And then look at that number 100 and say to yourself, what's the number of interviews? I call them tests. And the experts in the field call them tests. 
we're testing the market. And it's one of the scariest things. And people have always got walls that go up about doing it. But afterwards, after three or four interviews, they look at me and go, wow, man, that gave me what I needed. And I've got contacts. And this person's introducing me to that. This person's introducing me to that person. And it is, as an example, if you've got a hot yoga mat, have you talked to all the senior exercising people that are working at all the senior centers across the city of Albuquerque? Because there's a lot of them. And most of them are people like you who've retired now and got PhDs and are doing chair yoga. What an interesting thing. So at this point, I'm thinking you have questions, but what I would like to ask you to do is as you think of things, would you please write them down? If you've got um, I like to use stickies on my computer. I, I use the sticky app all the time, but um, I don't like to have a little piece of paper everywhere. But if you've got stickies, you've got ideas, you've got pieces of paper that are torn into shreds, or you've just got one piece of paper you're going to stick them to, as you get ideas about what you need to do, what questions you would like to ask, what hypotheses you have, please take a minute or so to write those things down. Don't lose them while we're doing this presentation. So I know that each one of you probably got a vision of the problem you think you're solving and what the solutions seem to be. Um, I like to laugh because a lot of times when I'm working with entrepreneurs, we either think it's a vision or a hallucination. Um, and sometimes it is a hallucination because we're dreaming about it at night while we're sleeping and come up with an idea at three o'clock in the morning. One option is to, is to launch a product before we know whether or not we've got market with every feature we can think of or even the simplest product with only one feature. But what we're worried about is that if we spend all the time and money to perfect this product, especially if it's high tech, is that we're gonna waste a lot of money in, in engineering time and the cash that we've got on hand. We don't need to be perfect for our first launch. As a matter of fact, when we're working with software companies, we do this iterative um, launch of various versions of the software, okay? Like if I'm working on a software that helps me keep track of the, the uh, exercising I'm doing and the calori calories I'm burning, which those things exist, um, I'm going to put the first version out at 11 o'clock in the morning on Monday. And at 5 o'clock on Friday, I'm going to put out the second version. So people argue with that, but uh, startups have done that very successfully. We bring people in who start talking about our product and give us feedback the whole way through about how this thing works. So conducting customer discovery and market research happens not online, although you do need to do some of that. And, but I worry about you spending too much online, time online. You need to get... Um, and by the way, one of the founders of Zoom is Dr. Bill Zaroleta from UNM and from uh, uh, a professor who's worked with the UNM Innovation Program. So we want to find out if your proposed solution and its features are enough to get people to use it. Any questions about that, about where we're headed? Okay, let's move on. So um, what are the reasons people buy, invest? I start here because sometimes that's the reality check of why they're investing. I've already told you that 95% of it is you. Do you know what you're doing? Have you gone out and talked to the market? Do you know what the market has to say? Have you pivoted? What are you going to do with that money? Why do you know what people are going to buy? What are the questions you ask? And do you have a, a band of supporters already? Um, those are the kinds of things we want to understand. And this is basically the outline for a pitch deck. We're doing a pitch deck competition on Friday uh, through a hackathon at UNM. If you haven't ever seen one of these things done, you might want to come to that. Uh, Matthew, it starts at six o'clock on Friday, the, the 14th, doesn't it, at the Lobo Rainforest? Um, th that's when final presentations are, yes. Yeah, final presentations. And you're gonna be looking at companies who have worked solid for two and a half days on this pitch slide deck presentation to talk to potential investors. There's a total prize pool of about $25,000. So what they're gonna be presenting, and this is what you present to investors, and this is why you need this information because you're gonna need it for the banks too, for a loan, is what is the problem you solve, your solution and how unique it is. And oh, by the way, how do you know? This isn't a hypothesis anymore. It has to have some demonstration behind it. Market size, what is the total market and total accessible market? We're gonna be talking about that. What, is, what did the market have to say about your, your idea? Um, a upper level tech description. 
I can, I'll tell you a story about this real quick. Working at Los Alamos National Lab, I have been given the job at 32 years of age as the contract review board chief. I'm reviewing all of the technology and I have a signature authority of $53 million and I'm going, say what? And I'm reading all this technology and boy, I could talk about it like crazy, but I didn't know how to sell it. I didn't realize that learning about what the customer's needs were is how you sell. It's all about relationships, even for high tech. So upper level tech description, that's all we're giving if, when we do these pitches because we'll have more time to talk about it later. Traction, what have you accomplished? Do you have a minimal viable product? Not all your bells and whistles, just enough that people are interested. Um, what is your team? Your team becomes 90% of the decision. If you're working alone, we wanna know who else is behind you. If it's your dad, you're gonna say your dad. If it's your mom, you're gonna say your mom. If your spouse or partner, you're gonna say them. And then who are you getting mentoring from? We want to know who your team is. Competition, who are they? Do not diss your competition, but we want you to talk about them. And financials, what's your current spend, your future spend? How much have you raised so far? Where'd you get the money from? It was your credit card? You're going to, or a crowdfunding thing? You're going, to, you're going to say that. And then the amount that you're raising and for what? And what is your financial model? How are you going to sell to others and how many interviews have you done? And how did you learn? And what did you learn about how your potential customers buy? Okay. So I'm not going to get into that any further. I'm going to move forward to what an entrepreneur is. Because typically, I get a wall set up. We all do as mentors. And this is what they say to this. I'm competing against this company. I'm following the customer development process. And I've talked to a lot of customers. So have you used that company's product? Have you used their a particular toothbrush? Do you know how they distribute it? Do you know how, know how they created demand? Why do people keep on buying it? Why are they buying this thing that looks like an Invisalign or the brushes? Um, do you know how many their units they're selling? Do you know the arch type of the customers? Now, what do we be by arch type? Their typical customer. How old are they? Where do they live? What does their financial uh, spending look like? And why do they want this thing? Um, typically, the entrepreneur says to me, well, no, but my product's much better than theirs. And I go like this. Stop. Right there. How do you know? Well, I talked to the, my family and stuff. Did you talk to your competitors? Do you talk to people who are buying this? And we go through that cycle all over. That's going to take too much time. I don't have the time. I'm finishing up my product. The number of companies that have finished up their product and failed, well, don't even diss the product. Investors want to see your prototype. But... They don't need it. They don't want to see it finally done unless you've had a tremendous amount of customer feedback. So in an existing market, customer development means you really understood what people need, how they're using it, what they're willing to pay for it. And this includes a, uh, um, a laser or a uh, Wi-Fi signal that you've created that can go into space. Sorry. They want to know who's going to use it and why. And you need to know about your competitors in detail. What are they doing? What are their products features? Why didn't they build what you built? What do they think customers need? And believe me, your competitors are going to talk to you. You're telling them you're in a brand new startup market in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that it's one of the considered to be one of the best places to start up a company. Um, and that the cost of doing business is lower. And you are working on this product. Um, you're getting supported by CNM. You're getting supported by UNM. You're getting uh, um, uh, supported by a state university somewhere. Do that because you're going to be surprised who talks to you. Okay? You don't know who's going to talk to you until you ask. Um, sometimes people will say, especially with software, we're offering a lower cost uh, version of um, how to track your fitness. And we're about it ready to ship a device that does this you can wear on your wrist in about a week. Okay, that's a great hypothesis. But did customers tell you they'll buy it if your version is cheaper? Let's face it. People buy iPhones that cost $1,400. And they have a total loyalty to the product because it meets their needs. What needs is it meeting? Okay, same thing with what it is you're offering and shipping. What needs are it meeting? I don't care if you've got something that looks at the nano level 
at a thin film and make sure the structures are, are working. Do, does it bother these companies that the thin films they're making for computers and cell phones and TV sets, that some 60% of the product's getting thrown away because the structures aren't right? That's what they're currently doing. Are they disturbed by that? Turns out they are. And we have a wonderful former student from UNM that's working on that. So does your hypothesis about why people will buy match reality do this before you write up this pitch slide presentation and end up throwing away everything you're doing, make sure you don't need to pivot. Do this before you open a restaurant. Do this before you take a loan out or charge money on your credit card or ask family and friends for money or do crowdsourcing. It's easy to test. You're going to talk to people and we're going to talk about how you structure those conversations. Um, a lot of times people tell me I have something really, really new. Nobody has anything like it. And so here's me looking at them going, this sounds like Twitter. Honor looks at me, screws up their face and goes, you don't get it. And I sit there and go, oh, wait a minute, I don't need to get it. Don't position, sorry about that guys. I have to put this on stun. Um, you wanna think twice before positioning your product as being in a new market. We frequently have competitors. We're secretly working on the same things we are, okay? Our time to market from our idea to our first MVP and our first sales, no more than 18 months. That's why I get a little concerned when somebody says, I've been working on this for three years. Get out there, put passion and commitment and do it. You may find out you fail, but the number of the most successful entrepreneurs, like David Hale, who's the father of the, the com commercial biotech moment, market. And one of the things he came up with is how many of you put cysteine drops in your eyes? That's one of his. That made him a million. Okay. And he figured out what was missing. Gel. The other stuff was drying out people's eyes. All right. Did it go into an existing market? Yes, it did. But he started off by saying it's really neat. It wasn't. Okay. Let's go along to this process and what it looks like. We talked about this in the beginning. Customer discovery consists of getting out of the building, talking to people, and validating what their needs are in your market. At the same time you're doing that, you're creating customers, and you're building your company. Your company, the degree to which our company's products are built on what our customer needs is surprising. We, people start talking about having an office, have a conference table, we got to get registered with the state of New Mexico. Halt. Figure out first, whether or not the market's going to buy it. That's what we call it a startup. And frankly, a startup isn't always what we can call a company. We don't need to go through all that traditional stuff yet. We need to find out what the customer wants to buy what we've got. And that's why a prototype is often very, very important. We're going to talk about something called a business model canvas. Um, I, when I first started out doing this, we were writing business plans. And they were really scientific and highly technical. Um, and, uh, you know, a bio, biopharma product talked about all our research trials and um, what our controls were and, you know, our animal trials and how it worked, uh, uh, what we found because we were using certain kinds of animals and things like that, which I don't do anymore, by the way. Um, and we weren't selling. We first had to find out whether that product was needed in the market. So we came up with the whole idea, we're gonna write these business plans. We now do this one pager thing called the business model canvas. I'm gonna to refer to it as a BMC. I'm not gonna get into it in detail. But I'm gonna talk about using it as the basis for asking your question, talking to customers. So this is what it looks like. It's a one page thing. Um, I like to do it online in Google in my file. And then I use stickies. I'll talk about electronic stickies at the end. And I pound my, my I layer my stickies on top of one another so I can take a look at what my hypotheses were about what these things week one and how they are in week 10. Because we're gonna spend about 10 weeks validating our market. Um, the thing we focus on during this customer discovery is what's the value of my product to the market, okay? So one of the things I worked on was a particle accelerator that produces electrons that stimulated neutrons and it was and broke off pions. You're all going, uh-oh. Um, and using a digital computer program, modeled a tumor and only destroyed the tumor during radiation, not healthy tissue. It's called pion therapy. And we created a device that went into the doctor's office. Um, we were reimbursed at 4,000 a film by Medicare, 
the cost to do it was $400. So we started off working with horses, ended up working with human beings, and got bought out by a big company that now produces it. So we used this to go to customers, and we were so surprised that the first people that wanted to invest in our company were veterinarians. You've heard the story of how they end up killing racehorses because they can't repair their legs because they don't know how bad the cracks are in their, in their legs. Um, with this, they were able to do films right on the track and they were able to determine what the cracks were and there was no killing of, of the horses. They were saving animals and then putting them out for adoption. So we used our customer interviews to find out who was interested. And the first physicians we talked to said, why aren't you talking to veterinarians? They're gonna pick up on this right away. And sure as they sure as heck did. Okay, we worked with the very famous Helen Woodward, Woodward Clinic in La Jolla, in um, um, Solana Beach in California, in San Diego, working on racehorses out of the Del Mar racetrack. This is a scorecard. It's gonna, we keep our versions of it. My, our first version was that orthopedics wanted to use it in their office and that would be the first area we would sell. What we found out is we were the first area we we're gonna sell to was veterinarians and that money was gonna help us gather data and help us sell the physicians that would use it in their offices. But what we found out was the first people who wanted it was academic physicians. And they wanted to use it at such places of the University of California, San Diego Medical Center. So we had version after version after version that piled up about what was our value proposition, who were our customer segments, who was gonna help us reach those customers, those are the channels, and what our relationships were gonna be with those customers. Now you can go online, strategizer.com, and you can see the work of Alexander Osterwilder, or you can see uh, Steve Blank, work of Steve Blank at UC, and you can look at how they teach the, um, the business model canvas. What I'm saying to you is every week at the beginning of the week, you're going to say, what are my hypotheses about these things? And you're going to go out and ask questions because your hypotheses should be changing as you're interviewing. So research, test, validate. That's what getting out of the office is all about. You're going to ask. Where do people use it? How do they use it? Why do they want to use it? What do you know about people who are looking to be healthier? What do you know about physicians who are learn, uh, looking to be able to do simple MRIs of, a, uh, MRIs of a child's arm in their clinic? Um, where do your future customers live and work? Is this a product that's most likely going to launch in a big city or small rural hospitals where they do a lot of orthopedics? As a founder, you're doing it because you're gaining firsthand experience. Let me warn you about something. Do not hire a VP of sales. I don't dislike salespeople. I used to be one. Don't hire it. Your sales, you don't need that. Every last one of you in your startup is a solutions engineer. You are going out to talk about solutions to problems and then bouncing that again to your hypotheses of what it is you're doing, and keeping track of it using stickies, electronic, on Google, and Google Dropbox. And you're talking to one another about what did we find out? These are just some basic rules. I can't change them, but market influences everything a startup does. It determines the startup customers' feedback, the launch strategy, the channels, the acquisition activities, whatever it is you're doing, that 95% of what you create is based on what your customer is going to tell you. Different markets require different strategies. The strategies for working with veterinarians were different than working with university physicians and were different from working with independent physician associations who absolutely loved buying these things that we were working on, these M compact MRIs, okay? But with the universities, we had to go through supply committees. Where customers exist, marketing strategies are easy to determine because you're asking the question, how are they currently buying? Are they buying online? Do they need to see videos? Do they need to see testimonies? Can you do online training to show them how to use it? And can you do this to launch your product? New markets are very different. A uh, startup lets a customer do something using very, something very different than they did previously. And frankly, unique startups are heavily into social media, heavily into TikTok. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with that heavily into Instacart, Instagram, heavily into talking to people online about how to use it and their sales have exploded, okay? 
Um, and it solves a problem in my life. I like it. You need to think about how you're going to do that. And it may be you and your partner um, doing a video about how to use whatever it is you've got. And then you will come out and you start, they buy a thousand units and then you start talking about getting investments. Um, you're trying to decide if existing markets and new markets are the solution to what you're looking for. Are you creating a market? Or are you busting into an existing market? Most of us are busting into an existing market. Okay, I, I want to show you something uh, that's really kind of interesting because this is an interesting story. It goes a little bit contrary to some of the things that I've been talking about. We're going to take a look at a company called Boston Dynamics. And hopefully this is going to work and it's not going to be slow. And it's trying to get up there. There we go. And it's downloading. Okay, Matthew, I'm, I'm, I'm getting stymied. There we go. Susan, you'll need to switch um, uh, which uh, window you're sharing, though, so we can see it as well. Oh, you can't see it? Yeah, you'll need to switch which window you're sharing. Okay, then I'm going to have to dismiss this then. Um, this is not working. Okay, I, I, if you take a look at this link right here, go to Do You Love Me on YouTube. It is a story of Boston Dynamics. They're the ones with the most advanced robots. And they've got that little yellow robot that you're seeing as the dog um, on TV and advertisements right now. He's promoting a product. They started up doing this at, uh, through MIT about 20 years ago. And they still haven't launched uh, a full line of products. What they, what they thought they were working on was humanoid type robots. But what they discovered they were working on was a robot that they proposed as a dog and ended up now carrying a, a ton of materials on its back in manufacturing settings. And that's where they're selling. So, um, and it took them 20 years, but how did they get investors? They just were bought out by a Japanese company. Um, the, how they've gotten investors and a brand new CEO is by solving a problem of moving massive pieces of manufacturing equipment around great big warehouses that are producing cars, engines, parts for caterpillars, the, um, earth movers, and that sort of thing. They didn't go where they thought they were going to go. And they weren't building stationary arms. Other people were doing that. But what they were doing and what they've got now is massive robots that, that uh, uh, can move giant pieces of whatever it is we're putting together, including airplane engines. And they've reduced the size of those robots down to where they're about the size of a Great Dane. And they're hauling a ton of equipment on the back. Um, and they are still not producing a great number of products in the market. But everybody knows that what's the real key behind this product is the development of the AI. The AI is far advanced. Between them and a company in Japan, they now have the beginnings of facial recognition, where if you work with one of these ro robots over some period of time, they'll say, Susan, you're really sincere. You want people to believe this. They'll say, Matt, you're listening, and you're taking notes and trying to figure out how to work this. Jeff, you're trying to figure out what this, the applicability of this is to my product. And, 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 the, and, and the robot will look at you and go, Jeff, uh, do you have a question? It sounds like you have a question. It's the most amazing thing in the world. I got a chance to work with these guys and I can't believe what they're doing. Um, value prop. So let's talk about your interviews. You're trying to find out whether your customers uh, share your long-term product version, uh, vision. Um, if you've got a product that's going to last the market for 10 years, and but it won't last any longer than that, let's talk about flip phones versus smartphones. Um, do you want your, uh, the people you're doing interviews with to have some expertise to tell you how long do you think this will last in the market? Um, can you make quantifiable pro uh, product projections that we're going to sell really heavy into the boomer market because there's a lot of them. They're all growing old. They all want to move. Um, and so we're going to send out, sell them our heated yoga mat. Do the product features and benefits still make sense? You know, I've been thinking about this and building it for maybe 18 months to three years, um, or I haven't built it at all. Can my product be built into what my customer is telling me a my timetable is? Because some markets, especially when it comes to AI, are going to tell you this is going to last nine months because the next version is going to come out in nine months from somebody else. You have to really, really know how fast products like yours are being launched out of the market and whether people really want to buy what you've got. 
So did the customer interviews validate your, your, your uh, value proposition? That people are gonna want this, they're gonna use it for up to 10 years, um, and, but it's uh, um, because of the components that are used in it, we can launch other products off of it. In other words, our technology is scalable. Um, this is a pretty dense slide. I'll just go down to the bottom. Can you pull off a 10 time the investment made by your primary investor? Um, two times is good enough for pre-A, but basically if somebody gives me $100,000, when are you gonna be able to pay me back $200,000? And your initial early investors are probably gonna look at you and say, I wanna be very involved in your company. I want 20% of the company for my $150,000 investment. And I'm gonna work with you and you're gonna follow what I ask you to do because I've been doing this for 30 years. Now, if you are thinking to yourself, sounds suspiciously like Shark Tank, you're right. It is what they're doing in Shark Tank. I think it's a lot of drama, but, and they are looking for emerging products and sales and that's what they focus on. But if you haven't watched Shark Tank lately, take a look at it. They're talking to everybody who presents and pitches them about how do you know people want to buy this? And when companies look at them and go, we've had a million dollars in sales in our first year, they go, they've got information that people want to buy it. Or if companies look at them and sell, we've yet to put the product out, we're working on the prototype, but so far in testing, people have said they'll buy it as soon as we launch. Oh, tell me more about that. That's what they're asking, okay? And they're very much looking at you. They don't forget, they do need to be paid back if you're asking for investments. If you're asking for the, uh, small loans from banks, they do need to get paid back. If you're giving money to your family, getting money from your family, um, it would be kind of cool if you could pay them back because you may need them again in the future. You may need a 30,000 for one month to get your product out and you may need it from family members. If you're gonna do crowdsourcing, people wanna see your product. Okay, they want to see it. They want to have it in their hands within the period of time that you promised. So you're going to go out there. You're going to see if you've got something that you can get investors uh, excited about. Those of you who say, I don't need investors are going to use credit cards and bank loans. Mm, we don't really like to invest in companies that have done bank loans. Crowd sourcing, yeah, we like that. That's, that's very entrepreneurial. Okay, so bottom line, you need to validate also who are the players in your market. Um, one of the hardest things to do is to do that. Uh, we don't like to think of ourselves as having competitors, but how are they unique? Who else was doing when we were doing the compact MRI, um, uh, digital uh, um, uh, pictures of horses, broken legs? Nobody. Um, how were we unique? Well, we could put it in the side of a stall and it didn't get bogged down because of the kind of truck we were using to put it on. And how big was it? Same size as a computer. And did it put off in any field that brought in things? Well, if I put my hand over the top of it, it was magnetic, but for the most part, because you need magnetism for signal for MRIs, for the most part, didn't affect any metal anywhere, okay? Negative impacts, how quickly could you get the films? Um, not 30 minutes, within 15 seconds. So you have to be willing to describe what are the differences. Were customers willing to pay for that? Yes, because a veterinarian was looking at putting down a million dollar horse, okay? So what are your three top markets is what you wanna find out. Which ones did you find out were valid? Like I said, we thought it was physicians that turned out to be veterinarians. And what did the market to say about your product or service? They were worried that if it didn't work or the first few times they used it, that they were going to have this big piece of machinery, which it wasn't very big. Again, it was as big as a computer workstation inside the stall with the horse and how are they going to get it out? So we discovered we needed to have service techs in the field and train their people until we no longer needed to be there. Mm -hmm. Did we pivot? Yes, we pivoted in how big it was and how it was encased and how it worked. And we did. Um, and um, how many did we ask? We had 50 veterinarians we talked to in Southern California. And are, are they still asking? They're working with another company because we sold it, okay? We had an equity of them. So this is something called an ecosystem. And this is what we learned about by asking questions. Who's in our ecosystem? This is a funny one because it has to do with uh, an accessory 
for a motorized wheelchair for individuals who are, have limited mobility from the waist up, we were trying to figure out who makes the buying decision. It's one of the things you need to figure out because that's who you're going to position yourself to sell to. We thought initially caregivers, family members made that decision. We thought the adapters, we didn't talk about people being disabled. We called them adapters. We figured out the people using the wheelchair made the decision. We thought the clinicians, the therapists and the physicians made it. Guess what we found out? Well, Susan, you just did it again. Um, where did I go? We discovered it was the insurance providers that a physician could say, Susan is working, so therefore she needs an elevator chair in her wheelchair, only to find out that the insurance company said what Medicare cares about is that they can get around their home and you can't have an elevator chair to help you stand up. Now, we didn't know that. And it was really interesting getting involved with the policymakers and figuring out who was going to make the buying decision. Well, we also found out something else, that the other gorilla in the field was the, uh, the equipment manufacturers and that they could be, if they liked what we were building, such as new motion, and they did, um, they would be willing to recommend it as being attached to the wheelchair. And what were we building? We were building a modem and a um, uh, communication device for wheelchairs that was able to power the wheelchair, was able to power all the things that a person would use, their phone, their laptop, so they could go to school so that they could work and they didn't have to plug into a wall somewhere. Because everybody that we talked to was finding themselves stranded at some point because their batteries weren't charged. And we had a charger. And how did we do it? It was solar and we were using solar panels that were developed by a professor at UNM. And they were about this big. It was really interesting to figure out that everybody thought that was a great idea, but that they weren't the ones making the decision. So we had to go start talking to insurance companies. And we found out a lot of stuff about how if it's not medically necessary, it wasn't going to get paid for. And it was now an accessory. People were going to have to come up with cash. And we were going to have to fund it by raising money for people to buy it. So that's what happens when you talk to the ecosystem. You're talking to who the distributors are. You're talking to any policy people. If you need that sort of thing, you're talking to, in our case, ins insurance providers, equipment manufacturers who became our proponents. And they were the ones that were going to help people make the decision to take this and make it as medically necessary for individuals in wheelchairs. That, by the way, is still in process. So when we talk about market, it's all, you know, you're going to go out there and you're going to type in what's the market for my uh, heated yoga mat. You're going to come back with a dollar. In our particular case on this accessory, it was almost $8 billion. How can I reach that? Well, I have to re research it. I have to reach it through other companies. I have to work with channels. That's how I'm going to sell. I'm not going to be selling directly to the user unless I have to ask them to pay cash, but then I got to involve somebody to get them the cash because they didn't have it. So that market was 5.1 billion. But when we talked uh, to the accessory market, it went way down and it looked like it would, what was really going to be accessible to us was about 1.3 billion. And that was people forking cash out of their pockets working through nonprofit organizations that were gonna help them buy it. Even though it really was necessary for uh, and everybody from a child to an adult to be successful in school and at work because everybody had stories of being stranded in the middle of the streets because their wheelchair was no longer working. So when we sit down and we think about this, there's three kinds of market, total market, um, served available market. There's a market out there that's actually using something to charge up, okay? And then accessible market for my brand new product. What's really interesting is that in the very beginning of being pre-A or A, you're in the early stages of your company, we wanna know that there's a million dollar market out there. For the most part, investors won't invest in anything. We can't show that there's a million dollar market within the first 18 months, okay? That's hard news. And for those of us that are starting up retail operations, we've gotta figure out how those real operations are different. Can we sell that clothing online? And we can package it, stick it into boxes, sell it, send it to people. They can pick what they like. Like we, they can send the rest back. Our business model is off of the prices of the things they keep. And the cost of doing business is that box and that return of what they don't use. And you know that there are companies out there doing that right now. 
Okay, market fit. Um, again, we're going to repeat this at the end. Get out of the office, start talking to people. Make a list of companies you want to speak to. So if you would take a moment, please, and just start writing down those companies that you, that you think are a market fit, uh, their markets are a fit for what you're doing. Create a two-sentence pitch that you would use or in, in, in your communications. You're going to put this on your website. It's kind of like a tagline, okay? My tagline has always been, have you ever wondered how you do a startup? Question mark. And people went, go, what's the answer to that, Susan? And then we work together. Um, network using social media. This is me with my heated yoga mat. Um, it's protected under copyright such and such. And creators, innovators, other people for two names you ought to speak to. And sometimes they're not selling. Oh, by the way, do you know anybody at Disney? Well, do you know anybody at Disney? And then they say, yes. Okay, I work with one of the animator, animators on, 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 on the Star Wars movie. So start interviewing, write up questions and talk to them. What kinds of questions. Um, you're validating the market by understanding and quantifying the need. We've talked about that. You're validating your minimum features of what it is you've got. You're validating who is the customer. And you're conducting 100 interviews. Um, production, of course, is through the peer. But start with in Twitter or Facebook. For some of the products that I've worked with, we've sent out a tweet saying, if you use the following kinds of products, we've come up with something new for the market. We'd like to talk with you. And we were inundated with about a thousand people who wanted to tell us what they needed. We were stunned. And we were inundated by college students on this particular product. So be thinking about how you're going to get out there to people. Ask for a short turnaround time. Avoid at all possible costs, a detailed description about how your product works. You're finding out what they need, what they want this thing to do for them. And only at the end are you giving them about two sentences about the value of your product, okay? Think about a cup of coffee. Think about doing a presentation to a group of them here is that get together every Friday night. Try to find something that's less threatening, but talk to people. We talked to people at Starbucks in front of the university. We had a, a, a group of people get together both supporters and caregivers of people who are using motorized wheelchairs and people who used wheel, uh, motorized wheelchairs. This is something you want to get a hold of my presentation. Matt's going to put it up. Um, this is a script for a sample interview. And um, it starts with, are you currently using a similar product to what I've just given you two sentences about? What is the demographic of your right of the user that you've got? Um, some understanding, how are they using it? Okay. And will, are you willing to sit down to a three minute, 60 minute interview with me to talk about this? And if you can, a small incentive, cup of coffee at, I don't know, Dutch Brothers, you know, iced coffee with cream in it. I don't care. Um, so when you finally do talk to them, you can talk to them on Zoom. You can talk to them. I recommend in person in today's day and time. And you're asking them, if you had an encounter with my product, okay, or a product like mine, what were the issues with it? How were you able to use it? What would you like to see done better? That's how they came up with the ideas for something as simple as a lipstick that lasts for 24 hours, okay? So be thinking about the kinds of questions you can ask to anybody else that you'd recommend to. Worked with one company that was working on, on laser optics for communication signal around the world. And they, there was a company that produced that and they wanted to talk with them because they come up with a different way of doping the fibers that are inside of it, whole technical process, and never thought anybody would, from that company would talk to them. He sent out a hundred invitations to talk to him on LinkedIn. 60 said yes, and one of them was the CEO of that company. He ended up licensing this, this technology. So become a storyteller and be the best storyteller you can be um, about, this is how somebody would use my product, not the technical, Technology of how it works. Because if they get really interested, that's when you're going to sign agreements and you're going to talk about it. 
maybe you got a potential investor. But for the use of your product, you want to talk to people who would actually use it. Know your audience, really do the research online as to who you are and who, who they are and who you're talking to. Please show traction. Have you sold any units? Do you have people using the units, have you given them away for free? Tell a great animated story. Tell about your competition. Don't stand, stand away from it and say there is no competition because my the look on our face is gonna be like this, really. Share your compelling, objective, qualified information via your pitch. Have you ever wondered how to, to, to do a startup? Well, my name is Susan Cornelius. I've worked with six, 600 different companies, total value at equity event, $1 billion. What I like to talk with you about is, have you talked to your customer? Do you know there's a market for your product? Bottom line, will they buy? Can you state with confidence about their value, the market, and the customer segments? And here's just a simple statement based on the data from customer discovery. It shows a market size of $17.3 billion. We will enter the market with something called the applause. It is a compact MRI and our business model is scalable because we're first starting with full reimbursement from veterinarians who are willing to, to spend the $150,000 on this device. And we have physicians who have invest, invested in our company who are waiting to see what the results are. Startup metrics are different from existing companies. We're not gonna be talking totally about the value of sales, but your first metric is what did your customer interviews tell you about the use of your pro product? Who in fact is your customer? What is the customer size? Please including your questions, average order size, lifetime value, how long is it gonna last? Who is gonna be the first to order? Um, what you think you're gonna be able to grow in your pipeline, that's the number of people who are buying from you. Uh, are you gonna be issuing different versions of it? What are the improvement rates and the revenue per solution that you offer? You're gonna start off with one exercise map, work, walk, work to one that is used in a chair and so on. So the bottom line in all this for you is your ability to listen and ask objective questions and not try to sell it's going to be what makes this successful. Once you've got a description of your MVP that you think you're going to bring to market, you're going to be talking to people about how you're going to package this and sell it. Um, again, the customer problem, your product features that meet it, who in fact is the customer, what the market size, did your minimum features resonate with the market? And again, of those things that we thought you need to ask, your goal is to get all this information and get 100 interviews in 10 weeks. Um, I've given you some follow-ups here. Create a list of your next steps with due dates, a list of people, companies, and competitors, and experts you're going to want to research and talk to. By what date will you open up a LinkedIn account and tell your story? About, by what date will you change your story in your LinkedIn account? Create a rough draft of questions you want to ask. Create a list of hypotheses. Set a goal for the number of interviews and tests per week. Matthew, our next steps are to talk to the to people who want to talk to us, and we're going to be doing 30-minute um, sessions with people. When do those start? What date is that? Um, that'll be on April, um, April 26th, everyone. And I'll be putting the link in the chat right now for you to sign up. We have plenty of slots left, and if there's a slot that would work for you, but it's not one of the options for you to sign up, just email me, and we might be able to work something out. We have to end, but it's, it's worth it saying little next steps in here that you can get to. Um, one of the books that I think is, if you are the kind of person that reads books or you want to look at work online, which I recommend, is to look at the work of Steve Blank from the University of California, Haas Business School, and you will get a lot of information about how they say you do a startup. You'll find it mirrors the things that I've been saying. And here it is, April 26th at 10 a.m. We're going to do a boot camp, which is a short, short webinar. And then we're going to do multiple 30-minute discussions of what you're doing. Uh, you can bring what you found out. If you want to find out more about that, that's Matt's uh, email right there. And you should walk away with more ideas and steps of what you need to do to validate your product in the market. So you can get investments for this new change that you're making in your existing business for this new product that you come up with. And yes, you are improving your business model and your technology at the same time. We want to see innovations in both. If there are any questions, you can reach me at the email uh, uh, or through LinkedIn. 
uh, and that's listed on the first page of this presentation. And Matthew, you're going to get this up in the next couple of days? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you who uh, joined us. Uh, please get in touch with me. Please come to boot camp on April 26th. I'd be more than delighted to talk with you.